So good afternoon to everyone. My name is Marie Bayet, and uh, I am an engineer at the Geoazur Laboratory, and I will now present to you what studies and application the Nautilus project uh, has enabled us to carry out on fin waves. So, as previously uh, mentioned, the Mugob Seismological Station is located uh, 50 kilometers off the coast uh, of Nice, at a depth of about 2,350 uh, 2, meters. It is composed of several instruments, including uh, a hydrophone with a sampling frequency of 100 hertz, which allows us to analyze frequencies between 0 and 40 hertz. Mugops have, has been continuously recording uh, all types of sound for almost two years. 2017 uh, has three months of missing data, and 2020 data are from February to October, and we can see it there. So hydrophones are the most commonly used instruments for marine noise analysis. So we focused our studies uh, on hydrophone data. What you see here is the representation of uh, two years of data in the form of spectrograms. Uh, we noticed the presence of a very energetic band uh, that you can see here, um, uh, around 20 hertz. These uh, are the vocalizations classically produced by fin waves, the largest cetaceans present in the Mediterranean Sea that you can see a picture here. So, we can see that they are present in our records at a certain time of the year. They disappear between April and September in over two years of analysis. In fact, fin waves behavior is known for its seasonality. The life of this cetacean is organized around two main periods, the breeding period and the feeding period. Uh, we see, uh, what we observe at 20 Hertz corresponds to the vocalization produced uh, by the males during the breeding period. The fact that the calls disappear between April and September um, do not mean that the, the whale are no longer present in the Mediterranean Sea. On the contrary, summer is the period when the number of the cetaceans is the highest in the Ligurian Sea. In fact, at this time of the year, krill, the main food of these whales, is really very abundant in the Ligurian Sea and this is what leads to the, the gathering of fin waves. The fact that the classic 20 hertz vocalizations are disappearing indicates that the mating season is just over. So making 20 hertz calls is a physical act that requires a lot of energy and concentration for male. It has been shown that fin whales have difficulty producing mating calls properly when their swimming speed is really high. It's, it is therefore quite possible that whales are not able to produce this vocalization when feeding. Unfortunately, we are limited in our analysis by our frequency range, and we will not be able to verify this, but it is also possible that they use higher frequencies to communicate. The best way for us to better understand and analyze this vocalization is to reduce the time scale. So if we look at the recordings over a a period of uh, 19 and 4 days, we notice uh, another peculiarity. The vocalization do not seem to be continuous, but seem to have breaks at regular intervals. On the scale of a day here, we can see that the pauses, which are several, several hours long, occur just before sunrise and sunset. In this way, the vocalizations have a variable duration of uh, uh, 9 or 11 hours. Uh, this behavior has already been observed in other marine animals, but it's still poorly explained in fin whales. It is known that krill adopt a diurnal and nocturnal behavior by migrating in the water column according to the more or less present luminosity. Thus, at night, krill tend to swim in shallower water than during the day. A study carried out on blue whales in the Pacific Ocean, for example, showed that uh, to feed, the large cetaceans follow the migration of the krill in their swimming depths and do not sing. So we can hypothesize that in our case study, during the breeding season, fin whales stop their vocalization for a few hours in order to take advantage of the time before sunrise and sunset to feed just at the time of the krill migration. 
So by reducing the time period, we can analyze the content of the sets of vocalizations and distinguish different notes, also called clicks. On the spectrograms of 24 of February 2020 here, you can see the classic example of a set of two types of notes between 17 and 24 hertz. We distinguish between classical notes and backbeat notes. So as shown in the figure on the right here, these notes are very punctual in terms of time duration, but extend in frequency between uh, 18 and 24 hertz for the classical and between 17 and 20 hertz for the backbeat. Uh, however, we also detected this organized notes as you can see in the two spectrograms here. Um, it, so they, they are at higher frequencies and resembling those of Finway's, but outside the standards attributed to the cetaceans. Um, we found these clicks between 20 and 40 hertz and certainly notes beyond that, unfortunately obscured by uh, our frequency limitation. But these particular notes are mainly found outside the breeding period. And if they are attributed to Finway's may correspond to communication. So faced with such a large volume of data, uh, manual analysis is extremely time consuming and challenging. The use of technologies or methods like automatic classification detection or machine learning is becoming an obligation. So as you can see on these two figures representing time series of seismometer and a hydrophone, we can, uh, what we have seen previously, sorry, is the ideal case. Most of the time, our data is cluttered in, with a lot of noise from different origin and discerning the calls made by whales is a complicated task. On the bottom left figure here, you can see the example of an easy detection of vocalizations not polluted by other sounds. While on the bottom right figure here, um, you can see that the differentiation between noise containing uh, vocalizations here and not uh, noise uh, not containing vocalizations is not so obvious for a, a basic uh, automatic detection. So now I will let the Dr. Jérôme Lebrun, a researcher at it Resist, introduce and explain the solutions that can be provided by machine learning or deep learning. Okay. Sorry for the setting, but it's not that easy to do these things. <laughs> and we had even a computer crash, that was a big issue. Uh, so, as uh, Marie just said, I mean, detecting these fin whale calls is really a big data challenge as, I mean, now with current time, I mean, there is this big curse that data is so easy to acquire and data storage is so cheap that we end up with hundreds of terabytes that has been recorded by the OBSH, uh, filled with seismic signals, but also very interesting signals like animal activities, meteorological signals, anthropological noise that we need to process. And this is something a human could never do in a reasonable time. And we would like to get a way to do it and to structure it into libraries that are easy to process. So we had to move to this new artificial intelligence paradigm that moves from human detection classification to automatic computer assisted monitoring, detection and event improved identification and to be the most efficient and robust at the level of separation of the signals, the classification and the structuration of the database. Also, I mean, one of major goal is also to enable new tools that are, I mean, beyond scope of human um, perception, typically to introduce tools like summarization, special feature extraction, genre classification in a framework where we have this efficient storage of all our data and we facilitate the multi-user cooperative work with also other groups within the geosciences and maybe to also uh, be part of the design of new smarter sensors network to enhance acquisition. So here we'll just give you a very quick uh, digest on artificial intelligence and explaining what is machine and deep learning and how, I mean, it will help us and that will be detailed further on by uh, Dr. Piotr Krasnowski. So, I mean, all these techniques lies in a, something which is a big world like artificial intelligence, which is not more than 
I mean, asking computer to help us into cognitive task. So the earliest, I mean, method that were used before, uh, I mean, this uh, deep learning new trend uh, initiated by Facebook, Google, and so on was machine learning, which was, in fact, a decision tree that you were trying to design. And from an input, you were trying to, I mean, ask questions, I mean, trying to find features and decide if it was a core or not a core. As you may see, it's quite also a lot of work, I mean, to design this decision tree, and it's not that efficient. So the real uh, innovation, I mean, in this field was when uh, many of these GAFA companies, I mean, understood that trying to run an old technology from the 70s, which are the neural networks, could help, in fact, to do all of this with just what's been called training, I mean, this neural network by adjusting, in fact, the weight you have on the neural network. So the idea is to have, I mean, here, for example, a lot of images that have, have been already labeled, like a red strawberry, a blue person, uh, an orange bike, and to run it through a system that will have a backward error correction if the detection is not the right one. So after, I mean, passing through this training many times, I mean, you end up having a system that is, I mean, quite robust and that you have tried on to some test images and you can use it for inference and inference is, I mean, with an image that it has never seen, it's able to say that it's a bicycle because it has been well trained. Of course, this is a very simple uh, example. And you can imagine that, I mean, the, the typical neural networks that are used by big companies and that have been used also by us are much more complicated and uh, tedious, I mean, to qu quite intricate to, uh, to, uh, to implement. So, but, I mean, our main problem after that was, should we do, I mean, the easy and simple things like to input raw signals? I mean, what's being recorded by the Azure Fund or the seismometers, or to input some classical spectrogram. And we find out that it's not working at all. I mean, it's not discriminative enough to make the difference between the different sounds, typically an animal call, some engine noise, or some uh, environmental noise, and so on. So we ended up using a tool that has been developed by people from uh, animal calls and animal vocalization uh, community. Namely, uh, I mean, a major developer of this technique is uh, Frederick Tonison from UC Berkeley, which is based on what's called the modulation power spectrum. Modulation power spectrum is a new way of seeing, in fact, uh, frequencies not only like, for example, here I have a pure tone that is modulated with a 25 hertz amplitude modulation, something a good singer could almost produce. And if you look at the spectrogram, it's very hard to see the 25 hertz modulation. But with this new tool that will represent, in fact, two kinds of frequency, which one, one is the temporal modulation on the uh, carrier, and another one is the spectral modulation, which is a frequency analysis of the envelope and how it's changing, I'm able to have information typically on this signal that are now very obvious. So I have these 25 hertz red bands that tells me there is amplitude modulation at 25 hertz. And I have, I mean, also this line at four because it's a logarithmic scale that tells me I have something, I mean, which is the carrier as 100 hertz, 100 kilohertz because it's a, there's a multiplicity Eating. So typically, I mean, now if I try it on a call from an animal, I mean, I have uh, the usual spectrogram, which is very hard to understand, but has a lot of information that people like a lot. But I mean, in our case, it's too noisy, this kind of spectrogram. And as I said, I mean, we are not able to get anything out of it. So you got this uh, modulation power spectrum, but it looks even harder to understand. But there has been a lot of work to understand, I mean, the different zone in this modulation spectrum. And you have three big zones. One zone that's important is this blue zone, which is fundamentally uh, how, where the frequency are lying, typically the carrier frequency or the pitch for human voice, for example. Here you've got this uh, green zone, which is the slow fluctuation, so the articulation, more or less the informative zone. Here is the identification, 
And here it will be the uh, information zone, how the uh, vocal track is changing in time. And here you've got a very, very interesting zone, which is the roughness. The roughness is something typical of animal vocalization because it's where the emotions are lying. So, I mean, typically a baby crying for food will have a lot of energy in this zone as has been proved by a group of researchers at the University Hospital of Geneva. And it's the case for all uh, mammals uh, vocalization, but also for some birds vocalization. For example, I mean, the Corvides have also this special zone that they use a lot, I mean, to produce uh, scream calls and alarm calls. So what about fin whale calls now? Can we derive genuine information from this recording using this tool? Can we uh, look at the increase of anthropogenic noise and look if it does increase or decrease the number of calls? Uh, do we have change in frequency, intensities on these calls? Do we have avoidance of the shipping routes in the Mediterranean Sea? Because, I mean, it's something that we would really like to know. And I mean, we took also advantage of this COVID lockdown because there was this big change, I mean, last year, that suddenly, I mean, there was very much more, much less noise, in fact, and there has been even the Alex storm, but I won't talk that much about it. Now I will let uh, Piotr Krasnowski describe uh, all these, uh, all the details. I mean, how we implemented this and I mean, the, on the results we got. I encourage you to be short because we are running out uh, of time. So Please good afternoon you. and I hope that you hear me very well. Uh, so I, my name is Piotr Krasnowski and I am an engineer at Itroises. And in this part of our presentation, I will very briefly talk about our approach for automatic detection of fin whale vocalizations. So, as my colleagues already mentioned, uh, manual analysis of recordings is very time consuming and inefficient. And for this reason, we decided to automate the analysis uh, using neural networks. And these networks are trained to detect some specific features in fin whale vocalizations uh, that are embedded in hydrophone signals. And however, uh, even with machine learning, uh, the automatic analysis remains challenging. It's firstly, uh, processing the large amount of data requires significant computing power. And secondly, uh, the underwater soundscape is very noisy. Uh, and so fin whales vocalizations are likely to overlap with various uh, natural and anthropogenic sounds. Uh, our primary goal in the analysis was an automatic detection of fin whale uh, vocalizations uh, in the noisy acoustic data. Uh, and in the next step, we investigated the characteristics of identified vocalizations. And we searched for some variations in vocalizations that may indicate some behavioral changes uh, of whales. Uh, depending on seasonality or anthropogenic noise. And in this slide, uh, I would like to show you some typical sounds that we found uh, in the hydrophone signal. And the spectrograms of these signals uh, are presented at the bottom. So I will play you a recording. And in this recording, you will listen to four different sounds uh, separated by short beep tones. And these are a fin whale call, uh, an earthquake, ship engine, and uh, air gun. And I will play these sounds 25 times faster to make them uh, audible for humans. <laughs> hope it works. <laughs> yeah, we hope it works. <laughs> no? It yes, we can hear it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it works.
Okay, so uh, you could notice uh, in this recording that each of these sounds were very characteristic and so simple to classify. Uh, however, it is not always the case, uh, especially when these sounds occur at the same time. Uh, furthermore, uh, high background noise may hinder the detection accuracy by the neural networks. Uh, the optimal architecture of the neural network largely depends on the representation of input data. And some architectures, such as uh, gate recurrent neural networks, are naturally optimized to process uh, speech and audio signals. Uh, however, in our work, we took a less usual approach. Namely, we decided to represent hydrophone recordings using images. And this approach is inspired by the work of Rueledou, who used spectrograms of seismometer recordings to detect tremors and slow earthquakes. In the top figure, you may see the architecture of the convolutional network that is adapted to processing images. Uh, the network processes sequentially uh, and convolves the image using a bank of trained filters. And this process can be viewed as a multi-scale scanning to find some uh, characteristic patterns in the image. And after each scanning, uh, we obtain a smaller version of the image. Finally, uh, the network compares uh, detected patterns uh, and decides which has the highest likelihood. And our novelty in the method of Hueledou is replacing the images of uh, spectrograms by the images of modulation power spectrum. And in the bottom uh, figures, you may notice that modulation power spectrum has some advantages over uh, spectrograms. Uh, in the spectrogram, uh, fin whale clicks can occur uh, over the whole width of the image and at every possible position. Uh, furthermore, some clicks could be easily masked by background noise. On the other hand, in the modulation power spectrum, the intensity of whale vocalizations concentrates uh, in some specific regions, uh, the information zone and the emotional zone. And it really helps the convolutional network to detect a whole sequence of fin whale clicks rather than a separate click. In this slide, you can see the modulation power spectrum of the four sounds that you could hear before. And we may notice that in every example, the sound intensity concentrates over different regions. So for example, uh, in the case of earthquake, uh, we have a very little intensity, both in the information zone and the emotional zone. Uh, for the shift engine, uh, the signal co consists of high frequency components. And for the ergon, we have only one artifact in the emotional zone. For this reason, it is much easier to detect fin wheel vocalizations despite the presence of other masking sounds such as shift noise or earthquakes. Uh, our neural network learns to detect fin whale vocalizations during a process called training. And during the training, uh, the network adapts uh, internal weights to uh, maximize the detection accuracy over the training data. And this training data uh, was extracted from a few terabytes of the hydrophone recordings from a single MOOGOP station. Uh, we obtained roughly uh, 12,000 of hours of recordings made in 2016, 17, and in the 2020. Uh, so what we did is we split the whole recording into chunks of 256 seconds uh, with the 50% overlap. 
And finally, we represented every chunk as an intensity image with its modulation power spec. So uh, in our analysis, I was divided into two parts. First was the detection of fin wheel vocalization. And the second part was uh, to detect some possible differences in the uh, vocalization profiles of fin whales vocalizations uh, in different periods, mainly during and before the lockdown, and also during some seasons, uh, such as springs and autumns, and also differences between days and nights. And in this table, you can see uh, the results of our uh, analysis. So first, we may notice that uh, our network, uh, we obtained very nice classification uh, detection results of uh, fin whale vocalizations in the images. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we didn't find uh, significant uh, differences in the vocalization profiles of fin whale vocalizations uh, before and during the lockdown. And there could be two possible explanations why uh, we didn't find any difference. Uh, firstly, uh, perhaps the noise, uh, the background noise was still high during the lockdown so that fin whales did not modify their uh, characteristics of vocalizations. And the second possible explanation is that uh, perhaps uh, there are some differences in the vocalizations, but modulation power spectrum is not sensitive enough to detect such subtle changes in the vocalizations. And for this reason, we decided to divide our analysis later into two stages so that we will use modulation power spectrum as an early detector to detect fin whale vocalizations. And then we will use more sensitive uh, signal processing tools, such as pseudo veal distribution and scattering networks to, uh, to get more knowledge about the characteristics of fin whale vocalizations in different periods. And uh, uh, in this part of the presentation, I mean, I will, give to Dr. Jérôme Lebrun. In the idea of the second stage is really to enhance, I mean, the analysis to be able to find the details that are important to identify the co different calls because the first step was really to for detection. This second stage is about using the Novig Neville distribution that is a modified uh, version of a spectrogram using enhancement from um, this part, which is an autocorrelation of a signal. So you can see, I mean, spectrogram of a typical of a fin whale, or the, here it's a say whale call, which looks like a chirp, exactly like fin whale. And if I do this pseudo in a wheel, I get something that's very nice because chirps are transformed into almost straight lines. So I've got very good information about the central of frequency and how it's changing in time. So I will show you now the four different kinds of fin whale calls that we've been able to extract and analyze. I mean, the typical fin whale calls in the Mediterranean are either these 20 Hertz classic, which, has, which are downward chirps, these 20 Hertz backbeats, which is slightly upwards, which is typical of the Mediterranean whales. I mean, this is this 95% of all the recordings that uh, on all the recordings that we have, we have been able to detect, I mean, 97% of the calls that were recorded. So this is quite impressive result. And I mean, we got this interesting result. I mean, these 30 Hertz chirps that are downward, I mean, that appears sometimes and quite often. And this very elusive 40 Hertz chirp that we I mean, it's supposed from uh, what we've been uh, discussing with Professor Chris Clark and uh, Giuseppe um, Notar Bartolo di Tura uh, is typical also of fin whales, but is hard to assess, I mean, from the recordings that we have with these low frequencies. So I will go to the conclusion. The conclusion, our, I mean, our approach has been excellent, I mean, for the detection of the fin whale calls. We have some limitations about the final analysis that we've been able to uh, tackle using the Villeneuve approach, but unfortunately, it's very costly to compute. So we are moving towards, I mean, something uh, based on wavelets, which behaves like the Villeneuve 
uh, analysis, which are called scattering networks based on wavelets. So, I mean, the next step is also to improve uh, the frequency uh, resolution by using higher frequency hydrophone recordings, means a higher amount of data, but it could be easier to process. To use full OBSH sensor networks, that means over uh, recording stations to reversify and improve the extraction of the calls, to add individual identification of inwell that was not possible so far, and geographical tracking, which is very important, but needs a full network in order to study the influence of the commercial route and the noise on their commercial routes to the fin whale behavior. And I mean, there are also these that I won't detail more because I mean, I think uh, it's a bit out of uh, the time that, so it's an idea that fin whale are using this typical waveguide uh, salinity depth channel to uh, communicate on very long range and we have to understand from the OBSH that if we are able to, to assess this properly. So this is for the end of our part. And I mean, this is a small slide to introduce the work that will be uh, described by Eugenio now between the strong difference between day and night in the coastal zone. I mean, typically you can see on the coastal zone that there is a huge difference, I mean, in the noise between the day and the night. There has been also a huge difference between within COVID and outside of COVID. And I mean, the first result that we had, we were able to prove that there is a 15 dB difference in the general noise on almost all frequencies, I mean, between these two uh, uh, periods. So now I will let uh, Eugenio describe his part about how um, uh, fish on the coastal zone are affected by noise. Thank you, Jerome. I'll try to be as fast as possible. So I try to share my screen. Mm -hmm. Stop sharing. Okay. Can you see my screen? Well, I take that as a yes. Okay. okay. So um, I will yes. um, talk about the work I'm conducting on my PhD thesis uh, in the framework of the Nautilus project on the impact of noise pollution on Mediterranean sparrows. So I will be fast on the introduction, as you could have uh, here the, with the previous presentation. There are lots of sounds in the in the sea. There are abiotic sounds produced by uh, the elements and biotic sounds produced by the animals which produce important cues for uh, these marine animals to orient themselves, to feed them um, for various behaviors. So I will skip this slide. And, um, but this is without accounting um, about the noise produced by human activities, because since the industrial evolution, there has been a lot of noise introduced by the humans in the environment. And the question that arises from this is what happens when this noise is introduced in the environment? It's what we call anthropogenic noise pollution. And anthropogenic noise pollution can have a lot of impact on many animals, which depends on the type of noise. However, there are still lots of current gaps in the knowledge. For example, there are limited numbers of studies which have focused on married mammals with three times more studies on mammals than fishes. Also, most of the studies focus on adult individuals without assessing uh, um, impacts on other stages like eggs, larvae, or juveniles. Most of the studies, impact, uh, studies uh, investigate the impact on hearing or stress without assessing impacts on behavior. And finally, in the Mediterranean Sea, there are only nine studies that were conducted directly in the field. So this is where my PhD thesis intervenes in order to try to fill these knowledge gaps. Now my PhD thesis is about the impact of noise pollution on Mediterranean juvenile spirits. And it tries to uh, assess the impact of bone noise on juvenile stages of Mediterranean coastal fishes by assessing in the field, the abundance, the growth, the shapes of the otoliths, feeding and shoaling behavior, and some specific biomarkers of stress. To do this, we focus on uh, the Diplodus sargus juveniles as a mother species because uh, they are really important ecologically and economically. And they can be generally found easily and in large number during the settlement period, which happened from May to July, which is also the period where there is most uh, boating activity and so anthropogenic noise. So um, we use the automatic identification system to select uh, different location, uh, either highly impacted by noise or uh, relative control with less boats. Here you can have two examples. Here, 
a location uh, with uh, lots of boats and also some cruise ships, while here there is another location with less boating activity. So we choose four locations, then thanks to collaboration with the Corus Institute, Jo Azur and Metropolis Côte d'Azur, we were able to collect five variables of noise pollution, which are the number of boats counted weekly by the Metropole, the number of boats passages detected by the hydrophones and the OBSH, the noise produced by these boat passages, the anthropogenic background noise and the percentage of time during which habitats are exposed to noise pollution. So uh, we use this variable to compute the principal component analysis that you can see here. Here are the five variables and each point corresponds to a location. And because the first PCA axis explains 80% of the variability, we decide to um, project all the location on this axis. And uh, thus we had a new variable, which is here represented by this noise gradient. And we can see that on the left, we have the noise location with the highest level of the fire variables, which is Marinière. Then we have Espalmador, then Ez, and then Capferra, which is the most silent location. And then we use this new variable to assess the impacts on the other, on the other parameters on our juveniles. So first, we did visual censuses to record the abundance of the juveniles in between May and August in 2019, 2020, and 2021. For now, I analyzed only the data for 2019 and 2021, uh, 2020, sorry. And we found a higher density of juveniles in the most silent location, while in the most uh, noisier location, there were less juveniles. And this result was significant and found in 2019 and in 2020. Then we tried to look at the behavior, the gregarious behavior of the juveniles, because some studies show the uh, impact of noise on different behaviors. So we took uh, videos of the juvenile group to see if there was uh, an impact of noise on their grouping behavior, but I can show you the result right now because the analysis is still ongoing. Also, we looked at otoliths. Otoliths are um, a small uh, concretion present in the inner ear of the fish and they are really interesting because when you polish them like this you can see the growth ring much like the growth ring in a tree trunk and so you can determine the age of the fish and thus try to analyze impact on growth. So that's what we tried to do. We tried to look for putative impact of uh, noise on fish growth but we found no significant results. The fish growth and the otolith growth doesn't seem to be impacted by noise pollution. Then we looked at the otolith shape because other studies found that stress can induce modification in the otolith shapes. So we looked at the otolith shape that you can see here. Here are the superimposed shapes of the, um, the otoliths of the fish we used in this study. We found some difference in shapes, but uh, we are still doing analysis to link these differences to noise pollution. Also, we are looked at the stomach content and microplastic presence because in this case, uh, some studies found that noise pollution induces the ingestion on non-food particles. So we decided to first identify the taxa present in the stomach content, identify if microplastic is present in the stomach content, and then try to look if these variables are influenced by noise pollution. We finished the part of identification stomach content, but microplastic presence is still being assessed and the analysis are still ongoing. And we also looked at some uh, metabolism, uh, energetic metabolism uh, variables, which are the reserves of glucose and glycogen in the juveniles. For the glyco glucose, which is presented here, we found a lower level of glucose in the most noise, uh, noisy uh, location, and this result is significant. And we also found a tendency for a lower level of glycogen, even if this is non significant. And together, this result, this decrease in energetic reserves, could uh, be linked to a mild stress induced by noise pollution. So as a conclusion, um, you should know that fish, like most animals, are sensitive to sounds and possibly impacted by noise pollution. Moreover, the work that I showed here very briefly allows to colorate the decrease in uh, sexual density with an increase in noise, but we haven't got uh, the mechanics leading to this decrease because we, only, we didn't fight an impact on growth and we only find the mild stress suggest by, suggested by energy metabolism. However, there are still a lot of analyses ongoing. And also, you have to know that this analysis has been conducted directly in the field, which is great to correlate um, 
this productive impact with the different level of noise, but uh, complementary studies will be needed in controlled condition like aquaria or mesocosm to establish cause to effect links. And finally, because many impacts of noise on marine animals have already been shown, it is important to establish protective measures to reduce anthropogenic noise pollution, like for example, close to the coast, implementing speed limitation or restricting the access to some zones like marine protected areas. So I'd like to thank uh, all the people which collaborated uh, in, the, in this work, also the organizers of uh, today's uh, event and uh, all of you for your attention. Thank you.